never talked about the car, the Tesla car. Yeah. Redox reactions. That's what we're going to talk about now. Um, we have uh, this is something we did in Chem One, but not everybody uh, had me uh, last year in Chem One, so they didn't. Not everyone saw it here and or in the other class. Uh, so I'm going to do a little review. It's actually not um, going to be everything we did last year, but it's going to be a good enough review that you'll be able to do these easily. Because uh, the reason I'm doing this is very simple. I need to cover redox reactions before we do our next topic, which we did not do in Chem One, which is electrochemistry. All right. Every electrochemical react, every every battery involves redox reactions, and that's what I got to teach you about today. Actually, starting today, it's actually not going to get to the actual reactions till tomorrow, because I'm going to start off with how to get oxidation numbers. A little review, because back when you guys, especially those people who did not have me last year with double periods, you guys got a very simplified version of oxidation numbers. All right, real simplified. We didn't talk about peroxides or hydrides. All right. You just basically had to do something like this, you know. If you have um, FeCl3, which iron are we talking about? What's the charge of iron? Plus three. Plus three, because you know chlorine minus one, so you know he's plus three. That's these are the oxidation numbers, and that's about all we ever used it for. It was that simple, all right? Because the sum of the in the in the in the compound had to be zero. There's a heck of a lot more to it than that, as some of you may remember a little bit from last year, but. Most people don't anyway, so I review it. Even if it wasn't for that, I would review a little bit. Because there's a lot to the oxidation numbers. First of all, what are they? They are the number of electrons lost or gained in a reaction in general. All right, sometimes they're not lost or gained. Sometimes it's just the oxidation numbers. You know, the electrons are actually being shared. But, um, you know, we basically consider the number of electrons lost or gained as the charge and the oxidation number in a reaction. Even in a polar compound where you're not necessarily losing or gaining them, like water, for example, water has H2O, O is minus 2, H is plus 1. Even though they technically didn't lose electrons, we still call them um, plus 1 and minus 2. That's why they have charge, because they're sharing electrons in a polar bond, but they're still considered that. So it's um, you know pretty easy. We've done a lot. You could not know how to do this and be able to write compounds from like chapter 4 on in Chem 1. So we obviously know a little bit about it. However, I told you we're going to get into a lot more detail about it. All right, there's some rules that back in the day I probably didn't give you any of these, or maybe a couple of them. But now we're going. I mean, I had to know a few of them. But now we're going to see. Um, and there's some confusing parts to these. A lot more of these. Uh, for example, the first one is an uncombined element has an oxidation number of zero. Now, that may seem obvious. But it's not. Many of you guys in Chem 1 in particular, we used to write, used, so used to writing charges next to um, every, like sodium is always plus 1, and chlorine and fluorine are minus 1. That's not true. Not if they're by themselves. Even if it's diatomic, like fluorine is diatomic. All right? Even if it's Cl2, like chlorine, that's a zero charge because he's by himself. All right? So when they're by themselves, Na by himself plus Cl, all right, 2. By himself, uh, forming they're zero. When they form a compound and they're NaCl, then it's plus one and minus one. Okay, so that's one thing. The oxidation number of a monatomic ion equals its charge. Let me show you an example of this where it's confusing for you too, because some people will say, "Well, you just said when they're by themselves they have to be zero, and now you're breaking it." And I'll show you what I mean by that. All right, say I have this equation. Don't copy this down. Just watch. I'm going to do some examples in a minute. But say I have this equation where I take salt and I decompose it into sodium and chlorine gas. Now you're absolutely right. Sodium over here is plus one, he's minus one, and I just said he's got to be zero and he's got to be zero when they're by themselves. Makes complete sense. So what does this mean? Well, that will be this equation. And again, don't copy this down. Look at the difference. We just went over this in solubility stuff. People will be saying, well, sodium's by himself. I thought he has to, be, has to be zero. Why is he plus one here? Because here, this is not a chemical equation. These are just sodium ions floating around in the beaker. That's why you put a little AQ next to it. That's why you have a plus one next to it. You will know the difference between this and this because if I give you that one, especially in the book, it always puts, I don't always in my equations put down AQ or S, but I have to put down the charges. 
All right. All right. So if I put down Na with a plus one, you know I'm talking about sodium ions. If I have Na with no charge at all, usually you just leave it off. If there's no charge, there's nothing else. Then he's zero. All right. So a monatomic ion, an ion by himself, something by himself, can have a charge. All right. That's where you dissolve it in water and you have that ion there. Okay. Now, of course, this one you had to use every time you wrote a compound. The sum of the oxidation numbers equals zero. We all knew that. That's why we. That's how we wrote compounds. That's why water is H2O, not HO. That's why sodium chloride is NaCl, not Na2Cl. All right, because it's they have to equal zero. One guy's losing, the other guy's gaining electrons. It's no surprise there. Now, we also have to worry about the polyatomic ions, which we did a little bit in Chem One, but not a whole lot. The big difference for a polyatomic ion, it doesn't equal zero. It equals the charge of the ion. So if I've got a compound, and by the way, this is why it's actually going to be important. You'll see in one of the examples I'm going to do with the board here in a minute. If I've got a compound like sulfate with a minus 2, now that S and the O don't add up to zero. They have to add up to minus 2. That's what the charge has to add up to. And it's going to be important to have that common ion sheet because you have to know the common polyatomic ions and their charges in order to be able to do some of these. Okay. All right, now comes some things that you seem like, wow, why are you even writing this down? Why am I writing down that fluorine is always minus one? Wouldn't I expect fluorine to be minus one? Look where he is in the periodic table. He's in group seven. Of course he's minus one. Here's why. He's about the only guy who doesn't change at all. He's about the only guy in the periodic table who will never have any other oxidation number at all, ever. Okay. Everybody else up there, even chlorine right below him, you would think, well, he's always going to be minus one. Uh-uh. Not even in the chlorate ion, the chloride ion, or, uh, you know, it's not going to be minus one every time. Even a guy like oxygen, who you'd think would be always minus two, there's an exception to. There are actually two exceptions to oxygen. Well, one of them has to be, what if oxygen formed a compound with fluorine? They can't both be minus two. Or, but they can't both be minus, right? They can't both be negative. Actually, when that happens, oxygen is a plus two. Fluorine's stronger and pulls electrons away from oxygen, or closer to him anyway. And then um, peroxides is the, are the other example. And I'm going to have you write down the only peroxide you're responsible for. But this is a biggie. If you guys, again, this is all the new stuff here, like from people who did not have last year. I mean, last year you probably did not, never saw this before. H2O2 is the only peroxide I'm going to ask you about. In this peroxide, Hydrogen is still plus one, but O is not minus two. He's minus one. Okay, so that's, again, you would not have known that. This is the one you have to know. That's the peroxide you have to know. There's another guy who is almost always the same charge, but not always. Hydrogen. He's usually plus one. We get used to hydrogen being plus one. There is one exception to that. If hydrogen is combined with a very strong metal in the especially in group one metals, we call them metallic hydrides. And you'll recognize this because in a metallic hydride, you have hydrogen usually written last. You don't have to write this one down, but let me just show you. Normally, when you have hydrogen written like HCl or H2SO4 or H2O, right? It's usually written first, right? But if you have a metal with hydrogen, would be written like that, sodium hydride. Okay, there is one guy who he is written second for, ammonia. However, he's still plus one in that. The only example would be is if you take a strong metal. He would be more likely to lose than hydrogen would because in group one. Okay. All right. And finally, the last rule. There are times you just have to use common sense and guess between two elements and not really know for sure. All right. And you got to make a little, you know, assumptions. They're not that hard of assumptions. They're common sense. And I'll show you examples of that in a few minutes. You see, you're not always going to have one of these three rules up here, fluorine, oxygen, or hydrogen, to, to guide you. So what you'll do is use the rules of the periodic table. If guys are way out to the sides, like a group one or group seven, they're probably going to keep their common oxidation state versus a guy in the middle who is more likely to have multiple oxidation numbers. Almost all the transition elements do. Some of the um, metalloids do as well. All right. Uh, so let's take a look. Let's apply all these rules. Do all this for some examples. That actually doesn't need to be up there yet. I should have. Uh, hold on a second. Uh, 
also met here. How long is this periodic table been up here? Uh, that one, not that long. Um, I've put it up there years ago, um, probably 10. But the original, I, I always had one there since the first year of teaching, 20 some years ago. Um, that one was not uh, laminated. I laminated this one and printed this one out. So the people only got to fill in the um, things with marker. The original ones were done with stencils before printers could do this. Literally stencils, like they, they stenciled all of those in. So. Anyway, let's do those example problems. Determine the oxidation number for all the elements in each of the compounds below. All right. Let's do, and I'm going to start, I'm going to throw pretty much everything you can see in the nine examples I'm going to do here. Then you'll have the rest of this period to do that homework. UF6. I have seven. She has eight. UF6. Well, obviously, uranium, you can't even see on that periodic table up there because I don't even have them. He's so uh, you know, far down. All right, so I have no idea what his charge would be. You, you don't either. But you can tell now because you see that fluorine is a minus one. So what must uranium be? Plus six. Plus six. Everybody agree? Yeah. yeah. Very simple. That will be easy enough, right? Okay. Now, let's throw a wrinkle in this. Notice I did not give you one of the three, fluorine, hydrogen, or oxygen. I didn't give you one of those guys. So I don't know necessarily that either of these guys, they're not part of the rules. I don't know that they always keep the same common state. Put up the two, germanium and chlorine. There's chlorine. Group seven wants to gain one electron. There's germanium. Group four, right in the middle, and one of the, one of the metalloids. Who do you think is going to probably keep their common state that I would have predicted from the periodic table? Chlorine, minus one. If I, if I, I have to just make an assumption here. Now, it's a pretty logical assumption. If he's minus one, he's got to be plus two. Okay, and you'll always have some basic, uh, you know, idea about which one to choose. I think. All right. How about this guy? What would his charge be? Bromine. Periodic table. What's he going to be? He's going to be zero. Right. Doesn't matter where he is in the periodic table. He's by himself. I don't care if he's in group seven or six or five. He's zero. If he were in a compound, he would be minus one most likely. How about this guy? Now I put three in there. Is that a problem? No, because I know oxygen and hydrogen are guys that almost never change. They're going to be plus one and minus two. Can you figure out what S is based on that? Let's make sure nobody's making a dumb mistake here. What do you have to use when figuring out what S is? Two things. One, the sum of them has to equal zero, right? And two, you got to use the subscripts. So if I look at this, let's look. 2 times 1 is 2. 3 times minus 2 is, is a negative 6. And S is in between there. And that whole thing has to equal 0. So that's your equation, basically, right? So what is S going to equal? Yeah, it's going to equal 6 minus 2 or positive 4. Everybody got that? Look good? Again, this is all review. I'm doing this faster than I would have done it in Chem 1, probably. All right, uh, Because I know you've seen all of this before. How about this guy? Now, this is another good example of guys where I don't have uh, a definite rule. One guy, the guy who never changes. I do have one. I have oxygen. He's a minus two. But I don't know about sodium and mangan manganese. Which one would you choose to keep his common state? I choose sodium. He's all the way over there in group one. All right, whereas manganese is in the middle of the transition elements and not likely to, uh, to have a con matter of fact, he has, manganese has like six or seven oxidation numbers, maybe more, I'm not even sure. But I mean, I know it can be plus two, plus three, plus seven, plus six. I mean, there's a lot of charges for manganese. In this case, what is he? Let's see, two times one is two plus mn minus eight equals zero. So what is he? Six. Plus six. Everybody see where that came from, All right? And this is stuff that you really could have even done last year, but we're going to get to some that you couldn't have. And I'm going to have to give you some hints on. All right? That's one we could have done last year. We didn't do many. Didn't do, very often we didn't have to do this. But there's a polyatomic ion. The difference here, I'm not going to be equal to zero. It's going to be equal to negative one. So it'll be Cl. We know O is minus two. So Cl minus what? 
<coughs> minus 6 equals what? Negative 1, not 0. You see it? And you got to use a subscript. I see somebody, well, not using the subscript. You go minus 2. You got to use subscript. And it's got to be equal to minus 1. So CL is a plus 5. Got it? All right, a couple more. CR2O7 with a minus 2. There's another little twist to that guy. See if you can figure him out. He's a polyatomic ion, yes. But he's got another little twist, the fact that I've got two chromiums in there. Some of you guys, by the way, can see these. I'm, I'm writing out the algebraic things here. You do not need to do that on the homework or on the test. You really shouldn't need to do that by the time you get to that part, after all the practice you're going to get. All right? But some like this one, you might have to, because I've got chromium CR2, and I've got oxygen with a minus 2 is, is minus 14, and the whole thing equals negative 2. So CR2 equals 14 minus 2, or 12, right? So what's each CR have to be? Plus 6, all right? All right, check this guy out. What's he going to be? Now, you'll notice, if I don't tell you this, you go to try, oh, they're both part of the rule. So, okay, plus 1 and minus 2. Is that right? I can't do that. It doesn't work out. 2 does minus 2 is minus 4, and plus 2 is equal to 0. This is the case, this is the reason why uh, peroxides don't have the charges you would expect. In effect, this is one, the one guy you have to just know is a plus 1 for him and a minus 1 for him. Taping. Um, right? Plus 1 and minus 1? Yeah. Okay? All right, good. All right, last one is the one I really want to, I added on this year because of what happens um, to people once they get to the hard ones. Look at a guy like that. You might think to yourself, well, geez, that's going to be a pain in the neck. And that's why I want you to get out right now your common ion sheet. All right, I'll show you how you can make this guy a heck of a lot easier. Yeah, wherever it is. There he is. Now, I could... I could multiply 2 by that guy, four, 2 times 4 is 8 of those, and 1 of these, and 4 of these, and try to do the whole thing equal to 0. I could. And I actually could get the right answer that way. But i got problems with doing it that way. I've got both N and S who have, may have, they don't in this case, N, uh, may have uh, non-common states. All right, so i got problems with that. What can I do? I can look at each of these guys individually. There are times you're going to have to do this. All right? Uh, NH4, if I look at the common ion sheet, and I find that guy on the common ion sheet, all right, I know he's got what, you, he's, by the way, find him on there, plus see him on, one. plus one, yeah. he's plus one. So I can do this guy, it's very, very simple. H is always plus one, with very rare exceptions. So what must N be in this case? What do you think? Four times one is four, so N plus four equals one, he's a minus three, right? Yes. Okay, so N is minus 3, H is plus 1, and the same thing's true for the sulfate. I don't need to do everybody, I don't have to take minus 3, uh, or no, sorry, it could be minus 6, plus 8, 4, four times 1 is 4, times 0 is 8, S, and then, oh, I don't have to do that. I can just look at the SO4, it has a minus 2 charge, right, and I can solve him. And H4 has a 2 on the outside. That doesn't make any difference. I'm only do that's why I'm trying to make out I'm trying to get across to you. Oh, okay. You're treating him as a polyatomic ion. It makes no difference if there's a two out there. By the way, I could do this guy. I'll show you in a little bit uh, what what I could do. But anyway, SO4 minus two. What does S have to be? See, it's, it, I can I don't even have to write out an equation when you do them separately like this. Four times minus two is minus eight. What must S be? Plus six. So my point is this: there are times you're going to want to do the polyatomic ions, where you can see them. It's a lot easier. For example, uh, if I'm doing a guy like Fe, who has many charges, I have no idea what his charge is, and he's combined with a guy like, don't have to copy this, yeah, uh, OH, okay, like that, if that's the equation. That, that, I know that's going to be one of them in the uh, homework coming up, maybe not tonight, but sometime. I could do 3 times 1 and 3 times n is 2, and, I could, and it'll give me the same answer. However, if I know the OH is minus 1, what does Fe have to be? Plus three. So it's a lot easier to just look at it that way. All right, then they go three times plus one, three times minus two, and the whole. And will it still work though? Let's see. Fe 
3 times minus 2 is minus 6. 3 times plus 1 is plus 3. The whole thing equals 0. So what does Fe equal anyway? Well, it still equals plus 3. It's just that I was able to use the charge in this case to figure him out. And I could have done the guy inside separately, like I did the guys inside here separately. Sometimes it makes sense to know the common, ox the common polyatomic ions and their charges, like OH and NH4 and SO4 and nitrate and all those other ones. If, I know you guys did not memorize them, although most of those are very familiar to you from Chem 1. That's why you get to use the common ion sheet. All right, your uh, homework is up here, 37 to 40, page 169. You could do that right now.